watching this video, you are going to learn all about the Olmec culture. I found this really well done podcast called The Ancient World by Scott Chesworth. Scott did such a phenomenal job describing what is known about the Olmec culture during one episode of his podcast. So instead of reinventing the wheel, I asked him if I could use a snippet of his podcast for the video. Luckily, he agreed. If you want to really dive deep into the ancient world, I recommend listening to his podcast. I'd also like to introduce you to three guides that we'll be showing you around for the next couple of weeks while we study the pre-Columbian cultures of Mesoamerica. The first guide is from the Olmec culture that we'll be talking about today, and his name is Ku. Ku's head is depicted as one of the colossal heads the Olmecs are known for. Next we have Ahau a Mayan with a jade mask for face. And finally, we have Tlatoani, hailing from the Aztec civilization and wearing a lovely feathered headdress like Montezuma wore. Here's a fun little challenge for you. I wonder if you can figure out what the names of our guides mean by next class. Be ready to share your findings during our next online meeting. Without further ado, I'm going to let Scott take over as narrator. I hope you enjoy your journey through the Olmec civilization of Mesoamerica. Now let's turn our attention to Mesoamerica, the cultural zone extending from central Mexico to just above the Isthmus of Panama. Early Mesoamerican cultures shared many beliefs and customs, and central to these was the cultivation of maize, or corn, which began in the region around 2700 BC. The growing of corn, along with other vegetables such as beans and squash, enabled Mesoamericans to settle into permanent agricultural communities. Around 1500 BC, villages located along the fertile banks of rivers flowing into the Gulf of Mexico, near modern-day Veracruz, coalesced into a complex society called the Olmec, or Dwellers in the Land of Rubber, for the rubber trees that flourished in the area. The term Olmec was used by the 15th century AD Aztec to describe the contemporary inhabitants of the region. The Olmec may have been known in their own time as Tenesalome, meaning mouth of the jaguar. The rise of civilization along the riverbanks was assisted by the fertility of the well-watered alluvial soil, as well as the transportation network provided by the Quetzalcoatlcos River Basin. With year-round warmth and rainfall, the Olmec were able to grow four crops of maize per year, producing the food surpluses needed to support a complex hierarchical society. This highly productive environment encouraged a densely concentrated population, which in turn triggered the rise of an elite class, which in turn created the demand for the sophisticated luxury items that came to define the Olmec culture. Luxury items were made from materials such as jade, obsidian, and magnetite, all of which came from distant locations and suggest that Olmec elites had access to an extensive trading network throughout Mesoamerica. Jade, for example, is found in the Matagua River Valley in eastern Guatemala, and obsidian has been traced to sources in the Guatemalan highlands and in Puebla, distances ranging from 120 to 250 miles away. Hematite for polished mirrors came from Oaxaca, while basalt for monumental sculpture and grindstones was brought from the Tuxtla Mountains, roughly 50 miles to the north of the Olmec site of San Lorenzo. In return for these goods, the Olmec traded jungle products, such as jaguar pelts and feathers, which were used as status symbols by other native peoples in the region. While the Olmec were not necessarily the first Mesoamerican civilization to establish long-distance trade networks, the Olmec period saw a vast increase in their range, the diversity of the sources of base materials, and the variety of items exchanged. In addition to obtaining luxury goods for Olmec elites, these long-distance trade networks served to disseminate Olmec culture widely throughout Mesoamerica. In addition to ample harvests of corn, the Olmec diet was supplemented with fish, turtle, and snake from the nearby rivers, and crabs and shellfish from the coastal areas. Birds were available as food sources, as were plentiful game, including rabbit and deer. 
Despite the wide range of hunting and fishing available, investigations at the Olmec site of San Lorenzo have found that the domesticated dog was the single most plentiful source of animal protein in the Olmec diet. When not working in the fields, peasants labored on monuments and public works projects. While most Olmec dressed simply, rulers impressed their subjects by donning elaborate headdresses and mirrors of polished metal around their necks. Planting and other seasonal activities were governed by a calendar based on lunar months, and Olmec scribes kept track of events using pictographs called glyphs, which have not yet been deciphered, but may represent the first written language of Mesoamerica. The Olmec are also credited with inventing the 260-day sacred year and 52-year long count calendars, both of which were adopted by subsequent Mesoamerican civilizations. Incorporated into the long count calendar was also one of the earliest uses of the concept of the number zero in recorded history. The centers of Olmec civilization were not cities per se, but ceremonial complexes, with monumental architecture including earthen pyramids, walled plazas, stone temples, and ball courts, all of which were also widely adopted by later Mesoamerican cultures. Rulers and the retainers lived in these ceremonial complexes, while most of the population resided in surrounding villages. The first great Olmec ceremonial complex was San Lorenzo, inland from the Gulf of Mexico, which grew from a large agricultural settlement into a major cultural center by around 1200 BC. The center itself had housing for roughly 5,000 people, while the surrounding hinterland may have supported an additional 8,000. Built on high ground between then-active tributaries, the core of San Lorenzo was extensively modified through filling and leveling, a process involving some half a million to two million cubic meters of earthen fill, all of which had to be moved in baskets. San Lorenzo also boasted an elaborate drainage system, which used buried, covered, and channeled stones as a sort of piping. After 300 years of habitation, the San Lorenzo site was virtually abandoned by 900 BC, most likely due to environmental changes and shifting river courses. At around this same time, an even larger Olmec ceremonial complex arose at La Venta, located on an island in a coastal swamp overlooking the then-active Rio Palma volcano. Unlike later Maya and Aztec cities, La Venta was built from earth and clay, there was little stone available locally for its construction. However, large basalt stones were brought in from the Tuxtla Mountains for use in monuments, including the colossal Olmec stone heads, which have become almost synonymous with their culture, as well as for thrones, sometimes mistaken for altars, and various stelae. Buried deep beneath La Venta, and uncovered by 20th century excavations, lay a cache of opulent, labor-intensive offerings, including a thousand tons of smooth serpentine rocks, large mosaic pavements, and at least 48 separate deposits of polished jade items, pottery, figures, and hematite mirrors. The Great Pyramid at La Venta was the largest Mesoamerican structure of its time. Even today, after 2,500 years of erosion, it rises 112 feet above the naturally flat landscape. A nearby sacred area, probably a mortuary complex dedicated to the spirits of deceased rulers, contains the earliest known relief sculpture of a feathered serpent found in Mesoamerica. To the south of these structures is a large public plaza, surrounded by platforms, which were possibly used as stages upon which to enact ritual dramas. Evidence found at Olmec sites, including stingray spikes and magwe thorns, suggests the practice of ritual bloodletting. However, actual evidence for Olmec human or infant sacrifice is less conclusive. La Venta was the most prominent Olmec center from around 900 BC until its abandonment around 400 BC, and served to sustain Olmec cultural traditions while also displaying the civilization's immense power and wealth. It's been estimated that the population of Leventa may have been as high as 18,000 during its main period of occupation. While some degree of social stratification likely existed, between rulers, merchants, artisans, and agricultural workers and laborers, there's no evidence that the Olmec had a standing army, a priestly caste, or other common institutions of later Mesoamerican civilization. 
Also, while San Lorenzo and La Venta were significant cultural sites, there is no evidence that they dominated the entire Olmec heartland. The massive stone heads found at several Olmec ceremonial sites, including both San Lorenzo and La Venta, are thought to represent Olmec rulers. Shaped from basalt, quarried near volcanic mountains many miles away, and transported by raft, the heads were inscribed with glyphs, possibly the rulers' names, and sculpted with stern features. It's been estimated that moving a colossal head required the efforts of 1,500 people for three to four months, implying a high degree of organization and control. Along with the stone heads, Olmec artists sculpted jade figurines and clay models representing were-jaguars, creatures revered for their strength and cunning. Olmec rulers may have served as shamans of a jaguar cult and claimed kinship with the animal. Similar to the Chavin of Peru, the Olmec and later Mesoamerican cultures believed that shamans could enter the spirit world and change shape, becoming jaguars or other were-creatures. Which brings up the interesting question, was there any interaction between the early cultures of Mesoamerica and South America during the first millennium BC? Despite several similarities, the current consensus appears to be no. The main reason for this, as persuasively argued in Jared Diamond's excellent book Guns, Germs, and Steel, is that the nearly impassable geographic barriers presented by mountains and the narrow isthmus of land interposed between the cultures of Mesoamerica and the Andes effectively blocked the free flow of people, goods, and ideas between the two developing regions. In fact, there is still no land route effectively connecting the two regions. Even the Pan American Highway remains unfinished in the region near the Panama-Colombian border. This situation stands in stark contrast to that experienced by the ancient civilizations of the Near East, North Africa, and Europe, which lacked such impassable geographic barriers, and therefore saw more rapid development in many areas of human culture and technology. The reasons for the fall of La Venta around 400 BC and the concurrent end of Olmec civilization are not well understood. As with San Lorenzo, a changing environment is the likely culprit, in particular the silting up of rivers due to Olmec agricultural practices. After their downfall, and the scope of this podcast series, the region remained mostly uninhabited for centuries, as volcanic, tectonic, and other environmental impacts rendered it less and less desirable. However, within a few hundred years of the abandonment of the last Olmec sites, successor cultures had already become firmly established in the surrounding areas, including the Zapotec of Monte Alban in Oaxaca and Teotihuacan in the fertile valley of Mexico. But it was upon the Maya of the nearby Yucatan Peninsula that the Olmec had perhaps the strongest influence. As early as 600 BC, the Maya were building ceremonial centers much like those fashioned by the Olmec, with temple pyramids, plazas, ball courts, and residences for the ruling elite. Over time, the Maya would develop into one of the most influential and longest-lasting civilizations of the Americas, and would still be around to encounter the first European sailing ships to reach the New World, nearly 2,000 years later.